Well, <laughs> good morning to all. Good to see you all on this happy Mother's Day. Hope it is a happy day for you. Um, I was down in Erie, PA Friday and Saturday, and Friday night I got a call from my son Dan and said, I got COVID, Dad. <laughs> and uh, I actually talked to, my, to Susan. And so I'm filling in for Dan this week. And he had a nice message for Mother's Day. But I don't have that. Okay, so we're going to do a message. Let's go over to uh, 2 Corinthians, please, in chapter number 5. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. See what we can find here this morning. And I'd like to talk to you about the way of the cross and what that actually means. You know, we have in Scripture the work of the cross, the work of our Lord Jesus Christ that we talk about very often. But then there's also the way of the cross, and that's what we want to examine this morning. So let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll, uh, we'll begin with our study this morning. Father in heaven, thank you for the opportunity to fill in for my son, Dan. I pray you be with him now and uh, as he's on the medications for, for this COVID thing. And uh, we pray you'd raise him up that he might get back to work in the normal life. I also thank you for the Spirit of God that dwells in all of us the spirit of Christ that leads and guides us uh, in, in your word and in our daily lives. I pray now that you bless uh, this little study. And I'll thank you in Christ's name. Amen. All right. I'd like to read to you uh, verse number 15. All right. Verse number 15. And actually that's the middle of the verse. So let's start on verse 14 for the love of Christ controls us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. Now, that's a mouthful if you start thinking about it. One died for all, therefore what? Who's all? All right. If you want to say mankind, I would go with that. And he died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. OK, no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Uh, Miss Susan was doing a study this week. And she shared some things with me. You know, when you go back to uh, Romans chapters five and six, it says, because he raised that we are to walk in what? Newness of life. So we're to walk in newness of life. In other words, we're to walk after the new man, not the old man. And why is that? Christ went to the cross. Now, remember, Christ was never a sinner. He bore our sins. He died on behalf of us, but he didn't become a sinner. But yet in his resurrection, how did he live? In newness of life. So we're to walk that same way and live that same way in newness of life, just like our Savior did. So keep, keep that in mind here as we go through this. So we must interpret, I believe, as we look at this verse and, and other verses concerning the cross. OK, I think we have to interpret the, the cross as an Ionian principle, which Yahweh intends to be operative in us. Because too often we see the work of Christ on the cross. We talk about his cross work and we're thrilled to death with it because we've accepted that and we have life in him. Right. But that's all past, which we'll see here in a few minutes. That's not present. We live in the what? In the present, not in the past. And we're thankful for the, the cross work of Christ, of course. OK, so I think this that we need to look at the cross in a new light at it as it realizes for Yahweh. In other words, the cross work was for us. Yes or no? OK, it brought us to a place of a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, here's what happens in Christianity. We believe because of that, everything that happens is for us. Me, myself, and I. And that's a big problem because you're not alive today and walking in newness of life for yourself. You're doing it for the glory of God and for those around you, which, which we'll see here as we go through, through some verses. So kind of keep that in mind. So instead of only appropriating the work of the cross, I guess is what I'm saying, this means one will embrace the way of the cross. Now, the way of the cross, I'm going to try this first time under Zoom. I wish I had a, a eight by four 
chalkboard or whiteboard like we do in the back, but we don't. Let me share something with you here, and hopefully our, our Zoom people can see this, all right? Adam was created, right? We know that. All right, Adam was created, but something happened. We call it the fall, do we not? The, the fall of man. But because of that incident that we see in Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter number three, Adam falls. Now, because of that, what we find basically is, is this, that Adam left the parallel he was supposed to be walking on in relationship to God. When you read chapter two of Genesis and even chapter one of Genesis, what do we know about man? God made them kings. They were have dominion over this earth and everything that was in it. See, they were to represent the very glory of God to the God's creation. And that's the greatest thing I think that that was lost as they fell. So what, what they did instead of trusting in God, all right, they decided to be their own judges, live by their own consciences, see, and that sort of thing. And so what happened as a result of that? Well, then God had to send somebody, our Lord Jesus Christ, all right? And he comes, and in this state that we find mankind, this called fallen state, or better darkness that man lives in, Christ comes and dies. And for what purpose? Just so that we could get saved and live life like we used to before we got saved? No, he died to bring us back up here on God's timeline, see? And I think we need to recognize that. We need to recognize that. So let's look at that here this morning to see what happens, realizing this, that the cross work of Jesus Christ was a past event for us as believers, All right? Now, it's not a past event for those who haven't believed yet because they haven't come to it, all right? So our realization is the way of the cross. When we say way of the cross, that brings us up here. So let me just put way here. Hopefully you can see this on Zoom. The way of the cross, okay? In other words, how we are to live in newness as, as, as we see this. Uh, let, me, let me turn back my notes here. Uh, a couple pages here, and let, let me share some things with you, because when we talk about the fall and the results of the fall, all right, it's very deep. Sometimes, oh yeah, man fell in sin. Jesus came, died for us so we could be forgiven our sins and go on with life. But what you see is this, that there was no longer a dependence on God for instruction. So Adam became independent. Remember, the tree of knowledge and good and evil was there. And what kind of tree was it? Knowledge of what? Good and evil. Well, who was teaching Adam about good and evil? God was from the tree of life. But Adam decided, I want to be as God was or is, see, I'll be my own guide. Of course, that didn't work out so well, did it, for mankind? Not, not at all. So what we find is this, that the emotion was touched because the fruit was pleasant to the eyes, making Adam desirous. So actually what happened? So his emotions began to control him. I mean, when you read the account very carefully, we know that Eve was tempted, right? And she gave to her husband. He ate it doesn't say that he thought about it or anything. I wonder why that was. Now, I'll leave that to you and your, to your imagination. But I think, that, I think, Dan thinks, because that's what he wanted in the first place. And I know many f teachers and writers and a couple of friends of mine that believe that actually, and you don't have to take this for gospel, that the serpent was Adam. He tempted his wife to do it. All right. And, and after all, what happened when she ate? Did she die? No, she didn't. God gave that to Adam, not to Eve, that command. They eat there, you shall surely die. So he said, hey, she didn't die. Let's take it and see what happens. Now, that could, that's just a could be. 
But at any rate, the big thing was that the emotions then began to uh, uh, control his life. Then the mind in its reasoning powers was developed for he was made wise. How was he made wise? Wise in the way of the world, we would say. The world that began just then. He was the instigator of it. Okay, the instigator of it. So he was controlled by that. Then we see the will. His will was strengthened so that in the future he could always decide which way he would go. You know, people call it free will. I don't know how free it is at all. We do what we do because we're sinners now, see? But when you look at these things and, and think about these things, in the fall, the emotions, the mind, and the will were all affected by this. So it transformed Adam from living on the parallel, if you want to call it that, of God's world into the parallel of man's world. That's exactly what happened. All right. And it was a sad situation. I believe that Elohim's desire, okay, was a life union with Adam so that uh, the human spirit could come under the control and, uh, of the direct, uh, the direction, I should say, of the governments of God in which he wanted. So things weren't all that complicated. All right. So in Adam's soul faculties, the being that he was, his mind, his emotions, and his will would be used and directed by the Spirit of God. But instead, what happens? They were directed by his own spirit. And we make up, you know, uh, today, is it you or God that's living your life? Okay, well, well, we'll, we'll look at that and see what happens here, okay? As, as what happens. So I guess what we want to say is this, as I turn my page in my notes, is this. What is the way of the cross? Well, we're in 2 Corinthians, so come back to chapter number 4. Okay, chapter number 4, please. And let's notice verse number 11. For we who live... We who live... These are believers now, are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Now, according to this verse, who do we live for? For Jesus' sake. It's for Jesus' sake. We're, uh, we're delivered over to death for what? For Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus may also be manifest in our mortal flesh. That's the key here of the way of life. But not only just for Jesus, which we would call the work of the cross, because it says being delivered over to death here for Jesus' sake. If we come back to Romans chapter number 8, please. Romans chapter number 8. <clears throat> let's, hear, let's look here, please, at uh, verse 36. All right, verse number 36. Here it says, just as it is written. Where is this written? If you have a reference Bible, it's Psalm 44, 22. Just as it, is, as it is written, for your sake, we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Who's the your here now? That's the question. So what do you have to do? You have to back up. Okay, and you come back to verse number 33. Well, I guess we can go to 31. <clears throat> what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who's against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. How will he not also with him freely give us all things? <clears throat> who will bring a charge against God's elect? Question mark. God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Question mark. Jesus Christ is the one who died. Yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril? peril or sword, just as it is written. For your sake, we are being put to death all the day long. 
We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. So who whose sake is this for right here? Is it for Christ or is it for Yahweh? It's for Yahweh as you, as you begin the, the, the whole context. Who raised Christ from the dead? Yahweh. Whose will was it that he go to the cross? Yahweh. So it's Yahweh is the one working. So it's for the sake here, as we saw in 2 Corinthians 11, uh, 4, 11, it's for the sake of Jesus Christ that we're walking. And it's also for the sake of Yahweh, God, our Father. All right. So if you can grab a hold of that, life becomes a little easier for you. So let's come on back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. One more time. And let me read verses 5, 6, and 7. All right? 5, 6, and 7. Remember, we're talking about the way of the cross here, not the work that Christ did on the cross. Because you and I actually magnify that work as we walk in this, in this life. All right? So in verse 5, it says this. For we do not preach ourselves. I think a better word than preach is proclaim. All right. We do not proclaim ourselves. How many times have you heard somebody say, don't preach to me? <laughs> they take that personally. It's a proclamation. You know, uh, uh, Dan and I, and praise the Lord. I shouldn't praise the Lord. But yeah, praise the Lord. Dan's getting to read a book that I gave him called The Simplicity of Jesus. I'm up to about chapter eight, and I don't, he, he was rejoicing with Susan, even though he was sick, that he can sit down and read this book now, you know, because how many days? You got five days or whatever it is. All right. Uh, my son has COVID, so you have to wait the five days or whatever it is. But uh, so he, he's reading that book. All right. Uh, Simply Jesus. And in that, and in that book, okay, the author actually brings out the, the, the point that Jesus came to this earth to proclaim not just the love that God has for man and the desire of a relationship that God wants with man, but to proclaim the kingdom. Now, this was strange. You say, why is it strange? Because prior to that, now think about this, in the Jewish world, who is, who is the head honcho in the Jewish world generally? The high priests were, okay? And then at that time, the Roman government was, say, Rome was there. Now, I don't know if you know this, but Rome was a republic up to about 150 years before Christ came. And then old Caesar came along, declared, I'm God, and he had Caesar worship and, and that sort of thing. But here's, here's the strange thing about this. Whenever a, the leader of Rome died, okay, there was a replacement declared. Nobody voted for it or about it. And what happened, there were messengers sent all over their kingdom. And the messenger went with soldiers to protect them and declare Caesar number one is dead. Now Caesar number two is the new king. All right? Live with it because that's what it is. See? Live with it. And so the people under that kingdom had no what? No choice, no, no alternative. Now, when our Lord comes in the gospel accounts, very interesting to me, he comes... All right. Proclaiming the kingdom of God in Mark one. He's when he's talking about, uh, you know, the uh, maybe you don't know healings and all that. He says none of that would happen except that the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God in Mark is here. So it was there already. And what was he doing? Proclaiming it. And was he proclaiming? Accept it or not. Take it or leave it. This is what it is. He didn't do that. He didn't demand that people see him as a king. And you see that throughout the gospel accounts. Because even when people wanted to take him as king, what did he say? One time he went and hid away. All right. Another time he said, he told the disciples, don't say anything to anybody until after I'm raised from the dead. So there was a whole different proclamation going on in relationship to who's running what and what God's desire was, 
All right. So when I read here in Second Corinthians chapter four, notice, please, verses five. Uh, through seven, for we do not proclaim ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your bond servants for Jesus Christ. Try to pull that today in America. I'm not going to get political here, but how many representatives think that we work for them? Yeah, zero. All right, but what does it say here? See, we proclaim, <laughs> we do not proclaim ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake, not as your masters. See? Verse 5, uh, verse 6, for God who said, light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the kingdom, of, or the knowledge, rather, of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Light shall sh shine out of darkness. What's the darkness represent? The darkness represents the heart of man. Yes, the heart of believers. Hearts of believers is just as dark as the hearts of unbelievers. But what is Paul proclaiming here as you, as you read this? Light shall shine out of darkness. There's no way a lost man can shine light out of darkness. But who can? A believer can. Because he has the life of Jesus Christ within him. So it says there, light shall shine out of darkness. Is <laughs> Darkness, that's in quotations. All right, where'd that come from? Let's see, verse number six. Uh, a Genesis 1 3. How about that? Right at the beginning of everything. So, God who said, Light shall shine out of the darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. So, what are we to do in life? We're to shine, we're to be the light that the world needs, just as back in creation, let there be light, and there was light. Where do you and I to be? Lights in the face of the darkness that men still have in their hearts. All right? What is that, Brother Dan? It's part of the way of the cross, the way of the cross. All right? It's living in God's realm instead of our own realms, see? And praise the Lord, Jesus came into our realm to bring us out of that realm to back to God's realm. As, as we see this. Verse 7, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. I'm looking at a number of earthen vessels here. <laughs> okay. So that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of whom? Of me? No. I'll be of God and not from ourselves. All right, not from ourselves. That light is to shine forth from us. It's in you. Allow it to shine. Remembering that the power of that light doesn't come from you. You're not the source. You're plugged into God. He is the source. Correct? Sure it is. All right. So, <laughs> so what we find then, come back to Romans again, chapter eight, one more time. All right. How are we doing here? Doing good. Okay. Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> so notice verse 36 one more time. For as it is written, for your sake, we are being put to death all day long. So in light of what just we said, who can you say for your sake, we are being put to death. When Paul is speaking then to the Romans, not just for the sake of God, but for who else's sake, are you being put to death? Everybody in the world, other men, to allow your light to shine so that other men can see this. I hate to say this to you, but the, the fact of the matter is, when you got saved, you became a new creation. Did we not? There's a purpose for us still being here. 
I remember when I was a, a, a young a young believer and I sat in a Sunday school class. It was a, a, a young married couple class and and a lady raised her hand to the teacher and said, uh, uh, listen, if, if God's desire is for us to get saved and have life in him, why doesn't he take us right up to the heaven where he is after we get saved? Well, why doesn't he? Because he has something for us. And what is that? That's to be a light that's plugged into him that shines out to men. All right. Shines out to this world. So the dying is life to others. All right. So the Christian life then can only be lived one way. It's unto God, not unto yourself. And it's poured out for others. Poured out for others. So I guess what I'm trying to say is this. I can't use his life for me. He died. And it happens to say in Romans 5, I, or in 6, rather, I also died. Who died? The old man. The old man that lived for himself. Even though he cared for others around him. But he still lived for himself primarily. Okay. Can't do that anymore. Because I can't use his life for me. If I still view the cross as it benefits me, I have not yet been delivered from the world. I'm locked into the security and the rewards of the world. If I still view things, well, the cross is just for me, nobody else. What's going to happen of it? No, it brought me life. And now what happens? The life giver, the creator came to this world to give his life. Romans chapter eight, verse 29 says we're predestined. There's a, there's a, there's a swear word in Christianity. And it says predestination. God chose all right. Us after we're believers to be what? To be conformed to the image of his son. His son is the one who lived in the glories of heaven as a life giver, as a creator and everything else that he was to give himself by coming in the incarnation and becoming man, flesh and blood, just like his brethren, it says in Hebrews. All right. But we're to do the same. Uh, go to John chapter 19. Okay, John, please. John chapter 19. And notice what it says here in verse number 30. Verse 30 says this. Now, I want you to think about this. You folks at home and folks are sitting with me right here. How would you interpret this? Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now, one of you Bible readers, interpret that for me. It is finished. What was finished? What work? Okay, anybody else have a thought on that? That's a good thought, Rose. It's finished. What's finished? That cross work of redemption was finished. He said so. Do you believe God? I'm, I'm beginning to learn in my Christianity that most Christians still have a hard time believing what God said about certain things. But in this fact, he said it's finished. I mean, uh, so I know this. The cross work was finished. Now, everything else involved in it is still going to be revealed, especially by Paul. Peter says some things about it, all right? But it was still what? Finished. In the mind's eye of God, it was finished. So thus, when we reckon Christ's death for us and our own death with him, what was it? It was past tense. Notice with me. Come back to, uh, let's come up to Romans 6. Finished, finished, past tense. Romans chapter 6, notice verse 3, please. We'll read 3 through 5 in Romans 6. Or do you not know? 
Anybody ever write you a letter and say, don't you know, Brother Dick? Don't you know, Carl? Okay? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into what? Into his death. Where was his death? On Calvary's cross. See? Therefore, because of that, we have been buried with him through baptism into death. There's death twice. So that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in what kind of life? Newness. Newness. And I mentioned this earlier with Susan's little study she did. I died, I died, but we're raised from that death so that we could walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his what? Death. Certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his what? His resurrection. So these things get exciting. And when you see the word death, you shouldn't be afraid of it. Christ suffered death, but what did he say about it? It is finished. He gave up the spirit to the Father. Say, spirit of life. Come over to Galatians with me, please, in chapter 2. Right, Galatians chapter 2. All right, Galatians chapter 2. Very familiar verse for us. Verse number 20. I have been crucified with Christ. Oh, wait a minute. When did that happen? That happened the moment you were you believed? Christ have to keep dying for every person? No, it was a one-time thing. God sees us as crucified with him. I've been crucified with him. It is no longer I who live. I wonder how many times Paul uses that terminology. It's not I who live. It's Christ, right? But Christ lives where? In me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faithfulness of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. And that's a wonderful statement. Let me ask you a question. When you're tempted, who tempts you? What's that? All right, Richard says, I do. Rose says, yourself. And that's who does it. It's whatever's in that dark heart of yours that still wants to hang on, see? So what thoughts should we have about that? How do we overcome that, in other words? Well, right here is this verse. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives where? In me, in the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faithfulness of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. That's the remembrance we have to have. Say, wait a minute, I'm not my own. I was bought with a price. See? Bought with a price. It's a wonderful thing. Christ left the glories of heaven. He came out, down to the realm of men so he could get us out of the realm of men into God's realm. But at the same time, do what? Be a light to those that are still in the realm of men. All right. But one more verse. Come back to back to Romans. I should have had you hold your finger there. Come back to Romans chapter number six. One more time. Okay. Romans chapter number six. And notice verse 11. So even, even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin. Consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Christ already died for sin, did he not? You died with him to that sin. So you have to account it. You have to reckon it. That's what the word consider there is in different Bibles, right? Reckon yourselves to be dead to what? Because we are now alive to God in whom? Christ, and notice it's Christ Jesus and not Jesus Christ. What's the difference there? All right. Christ is the anointed one. All right. He is the Messiah. So it's him that went to the cross. See? In the person of Jesus, as we see that. 
So it's wonderful. So the work of the cross then, as we look at this, <clears throat> is that we reckon that cross work in our own lives, because we're believers, to be passed, all right? To be passed. Because it was an old man experience. When you believed on Jesus Christ, you weren't a new man. You were an old man, the old man. Go to 1 Corinthians 15, you know, Adam, Romans chapter 5. And you see that. Jesus was the last, uh, well, let's look at it. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. All right, 1 Corinthians 15. Notice verse 45, please. <clears throat> so also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a what? Life-giving spirit. We have come, we're now under the auspices of the last Adam, no longer the first Adam. The first Adam is the old man. <laughs> Okay, as, as you see this, this verse here, okay, we're under the Adam who's a life-giving spirit. And I think as soon as we can grab a hold of that, you know what it should do? It should change our lives. It really should. It's the life-giving spirit, Jesus Christ, who, who I am now under. So uh, uh, Yahweh's eyes... In, in, in the, how do I say this and do it so you'll understand it? I believe in Yahweh's eyes. Okay, in, in God's eyes. I'm going to come over here. All right. In God's viewpoint, right here, humanity. Ended. It ended when the second Adam came and gave his life for humanity. It ended in terms of old man, new man, right? The whole problem is that humanity hasn't what? It hasn't recognized it, right? If men could recognize that, think how exciting it would be. Um, I put a... <clears throat> We, I get two uh, copies of the Voices of the Martyrs. One's uh, sent to the church but at my home address. The other one is for me. And I, I brought it. It's, it's in the back there. And, and it's about a story. There's four pages in there about a, a young man who was a Hindu. All right? And uh, the Hindus, and I never perceived them as that. Where do you find Hindus, any? What country? In India. I never uh, viewed those folks as being persecutors. Because in my worldly job, <laughs> delivering brochures, at least half the hotels I go to, I go 200 and some hotels when I, when I go out, all right, in the five different zones. But half of them are owned by people from India mainly the Patels, and they're all the greatest people in the world, see? But when I read, read a story in there about the testimony of a young man who became an enforcer, because they were, <clears throat> now listen, persecuting Christians, all right, Muslims, and any other religion that wasn't Hindu. And it's, it's an amazing thing as you read that. And you wonder, here they are, these supposedly peaceful people coming from a peaceful religion, still hate all other religions. So what's that tell you about the God that they worship? That's right. So, so tell me about uh, uh, the Inquisition of, of so-called Christianity during the Middle Ages. What kind of God did they worship? All right. It wasn't the God that saved them. They sent Jesus to the cross that is now the life giver. Humanity has never come to grips with the idea that somebody came to give their life for them. The world hasn't come to that. And what are you and I to do about it? Preach at them? 
No, we're to proclaim it. How do we proclaim it? By allowing the light to shine forth in our lives. That's how it happens. All right. That's how it happens. All right. Let me see. Where am I? So <clears throat> I believe this. And in Yahweh's eyes, the race of mankind ended. Ephesians 2.1. Therefore, being dead in or to your sins, depending on which one, see, that's what it's all about. So that brings forth what we know to be the new man. Come back to Romans one more time and our favorite chapter here for the morning, chapter number six. Right. Let me read verse number four one more time where it says this. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism unto, into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too, what's the next word in, in your Bible there? Right. Might walk. So what's that mean? Yes, it's, it, you're not forced into it. As Susan just said, it's your responsibility. I think the King James should, should walk. That's what should, or <laughs> God wants to happen. Walk in the newness of life, okay? <laughs> Yahweh never forces the way of the cross. In other words, he's, he's brought you up to this line, the way of the cross, but he never forces you to walk that way. Your desire is to still walk in the darkness of the world. He says, you'll grow up pretty soon. Okay. You, you really will. Now, so watch what we have here. Let's come back to, uh, let's see, where am I? Okay. Let's come on down to Colossians chapter one, please. <clears throat> so I guess basically what I'm trying to say, when we talk about the death and all this business, Jesus Christ was a spiritual, wasn't he? As a new man, he gave his life over. You and I should be up here. And when it talks about dying now that we're believers, it's not dying to the old man. It's dying as a new man. To the desires totally of God. That's what it's all about here. Colossians chapter 1, notice verse 24, I believe. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Now I always thought that was a strange verse, that Christ's sufferings weren't good enough, they had to be added. But when you see the light of God's timeline here, the way we're supposed to walk, you and I suffer as new men, see, so that that light can shine. Now, they keep that in mind. So I come back to 2 Corinthians again. Oh, I got to hurry here. 2 Corinthians and chapter number one, right? 2 Corinthians chapter number one. Notice, please, verses eight and nine that say this, for we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our afflictions which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so we despaired even of life. Now, that's, that's I mean, Paul, even Paul says despaired even of life, even though he knew the life he lived was the life of Christ. Verse 9, indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves, sentence of death as new men, so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises what? The dead. So no matter what you go through in life, what do, what do you know? That you're going to be with them, say, that you'll be with them. We live life, folks, by the life of another. Now, let, let's see if I can close this out. Come back to Genesis chapter number 32. Genesis 32. Remember old Jacob? Okay. <clears throat> and let's pick it up in verse 22. Now, let me read quickly down through 32. Okay. And notice what it says. Chapter 32, verse 22. Now he rose the same night and took his two wives and his two maids 
and his 11 children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and he sent across whatever he had. Then Joseph or Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When he saw that he had not prevailed against him, he touched the socket of his thigh. So the man that, that Jacob was fighting, we usually perceive that as an angel, right? The angel saw that he couldn't prevail, <laughs> so he touched the socket of his thigh. So, so the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated while he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for dawn is breaking. But he said, Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So Jacob was insistent on being blessed. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have done what? What men did he prevail with? How about his father-in-law and all those people who lived with him? Remember? Then Jacob asked him, verse 29, and said, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob named the place Peniel, for he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been preserved. Now the sun rose upon him just as he crossed over the across over Penuel and he was limping on his thigh. Therefore to this day the sons of Israel do not eat the sinew of the hip which is on the socket of the thigh because he touched the socket of Jacob's thigh in sinew of the hip. You say what is what is the lesson here? The lesson is he wrestled with God you see this, I've seen God face to face, wouldn't let go until he was what? what? Blessed. But yet God realized he wasn't going to let go. So what did God do to him? He injured him so he could no longer wrestle with him. And he walked the rest of his life with a what? With the rest of his life in a limp. He became a new man. He was no longer Jacob, but rather whom? Israel a new man. Now, where did he say that then? Watch this. In Adam, we live down in the dots. Christ came from the glories of heaven sent by his father to redeem us so that we could move back where? Same place, Adam. And I'm not talking about a garden. I'm talking about a life here and relationship. So we could live where? And this, dear friends, is what you and I must reckon every moment of our lives. We must embrace God's way of life. And if we don't, we're just going to be like every other person in the world. And God sure doesn't want us to be that, does he? He wants us to be the light of the world. So I hope that could be a blessing to you, and it was a blessing, but I gave you a lot of things to think about, all right? In other words, never take God for granted. Don't take your Savior for granted. You were brought to, into a relationship with him for a greater purpose. Don't be afraid of it. Most people are.